Hello and welcome. You are watching After the Final Whistle, where we talk current topics in the world of sports. We have a lot of exciting things on the agenda today. Stay tuned for an in-depth in look at Tom Brady's cookbook, our live Govs on the Go interview, and AP Two Minute Sports Reel. I'm Kurt. Joining me today on the panel is the wonderful Miss <laughs> Bryce Beeman and the great Hunter Sanders. All right, so we have a lot of topics to get into today. First on the list is the NBA. Not only the NBA, but the exciting push for the playoff basketball we are seeing right now. So, Bryce. The ball's in your court. Who was the biggest surprise NBA playoff team? Well, honestly, so I'm a Golden State Warriors fan, but I'm not surprised that they're doing well, obviously. But right now, like, I'm going to talk about kind of a surprise that happened to me is that I think the Lakers, everyone thought they were going to do fantastic, and they may not even make playoffs. And everyone thought, you know, LeBron got hurt, but everyone, like, I don't know, you gotta have a roster that's gotta back up, you can't have a one-man band, but to me, that, that was kind of the biggest surprise for me. There was so much hype that he was leaving and going to the Lakers, and then they didn't even do well this year. Everyone thought they were gonna win, pretty much, or like at least do extremely well, make playoffs. That is true. And now, mathematically, the Lakers are still, they can still make yeah. the playoffs. A lot of things will have to go right, a lot of things will have to go wrong. Yeah. Hunter, are you surprised at the Lakers? Uh, I think, of course, you know, I think everybody's surprised with the Lakers. Um, a lot, actually a lot of analysts before the season said it wasn't going to work out the way people thought. You've got LeBron coming in, a lot of young guys, and then a couple of old guys in there, like Tyson Chandler, um, Lance Stevenson there, Rajon Rondo, but they're all on short-term deals. Um, so the, the locker room chemistry isn't great with that team. And I think that's a big part of the problem. Um, like you said, they're six games back right now. Mathematically, they're not totally out of the playoffs, but their chances are slim to none right now. That is that is very true. Um, so do you got Bryce, I'll ask you, do you think the Lakers should try to get to the playoffs since technically they can make the playoffs right now, or do you think they should just call this season a quit and focus on next season? Honestly, for me, I don't quit once I do something, and I don't like a team that says that they're just going to quit and not try to make the playoffs. I think if I if it was my team, I would tell them, like, we're going to win. We can still make it. Like, we're going to play fantastic games. We're going to do it. So, personally, I think that, like, you should push for the playoffs. And then you worry about next season when next season comes. But right now you're in this season. Like, personally, I think you should go for it. And, I mean, miracles can happen, you know, like anything. <laughs> what if they true. end up having the great next several games of their life, you know? So, personally, I think they should go for it. That's just me, though. That is, that's true. <laughs> now, Hunter, uh, Bryce says they, she thinks they should definitely go to the playoffs. They go to the playoffs. Let's say they get the eighth seed and they face the Golden State Warriors. You know, LeBron James versus Golden State. What do you think about that matchup? Do you think LeBron should try to push for that with this roster, or do you think tank for – Whoever is the first pick in the NBA. You know, that's a hard decision to make. Um, and I think that Luke Walton's going to do the right thing. If the Lakers do get in the playoffs and they have that matchup against the Warriors, it's always a battle when LeBron's on the court. Um, so I don't think it'd be a blowout by any means. I don't think it would be a four-game sweep. Um, but as far as if they should push for the playoffs, it's, it's kind of safe to say they're already tanking. Um, Ball and Ingram are both out for the season. Chandler and Stevenson are day-to-day -day right now. LeBron min LeBron's minutes have been capped at 32 minutes per game. Um, and um, actually, something else I wanted to mention was they just brought up a guy from the G League, who you might know of, um, Andre Ingram. Yes. He, he's played 10 years in the Developmental League, which last year turned to the G League, um, and they brought him up for the last 10 games of the season. So maybe looking for a little spark, um, a little magic in L.A., I don't know. Well, they definitely need a spark, and speaking of LeBron and, and MVP candidates, so let's, let me get y'all's of uh, opinion on who do y'all think is the NBA MVP so far? Well, you know, there's several good candidates right now. Paul George, James Harden. Um, well, for me, I personally think James Harden, I think could, has a good chance of winning. I think he's a fan favorite. He always plays well. He's just always in the media, everything. And he's already won before as MVP. But I just, personally, I like how he plays. I think he puts up good numbers. He's kind of the face of Houston as well. I mean, they're obviously good players. But, you know, I just, to me, I appreciate how he plays. I think he's a hard worker and everything. So I personally would like to see him win again. I think it'd be fun just to be like two-time MVP here. But... That's just my opinion, but. Hunter, James Harden is a, definitely a good choice. He's anyway. a good choice, don't get me wrong. Um, and his numbers are pretty undeniable, 37 points and, and seven and a half assists per game. Um, I mean, that's unlike anybody in recent years. Um, but I'm gonna mention a guy that Bryce didn't mention, um, and that's Giannis Antetokounmpo in Milwaukee. Um, they call him the Greek freak for a reason. He's averaging 27 points, 12.6 rebounds. 
Um, and he single-handedly has led that team to the number one seed in the East. And granted, the Eastern Conference isn't nearly as competitive as the Western Conference, but to do that single-handedly with just a little help um, from the All-Star and Chris Middleton, I think there's something to be said, and I think he's the most valuable player. We're going to stick with the NBA, and we're going to talk about Russell Westbrook and the altercation with the Utah Jazz fan that happened, like, happened last week. So Westbrook was fined $25,000 and the Utah Jazz fan was banned from any Utah Jazz event. So Bryce, I will hand it to you first. What do you, do you think the NBA handled this situation correctly? Yes and no. Um, to me, I think, you know, as a star player, you're always in the spotlight and people are always gonna judge what you, how you respond. If you were, didn't respond to the fan, maybe this whole thing never would have happened. But obviously the fan pushed some buttons. But to me, I think that he probably shouldn't have said anything back to the fan, just let him go, let him say his stuff, and then the NBA, the security would have taken care of it. Um, personally, I think that maybe he should have handled it, himself should have handled it a little bit better. But I think the NBA did what they could. Like they find, um, and Russell Westbrook and then they also banned the fan from coming to any more events as well so I think that they pretty much they handled it as well as they can I mean I don't know what else they probably could have done necessarily besides maybe take, take him out of the fan take the fan out of the stadium at the time yes. but to me I feel like maybe next time someone yells at a star player you maybe just don't respond to the fans because they're, they're trying to get a rise out of you yes. they want you to get mad and no matter what you say or how you respond you're probably going to somehow get backlash on it. That's true, Hunter, and that's what fans are there for. They're there to cheer for their team and against the opposing team. Uh, this is not Westbrook's first mm -hmm. uh, altercation with a Utah Jazz fan. Hunter, do you think the NBA handled it correctly? Uh, I think the NBA handled it okay. Um, like Bryce said, obviously, Russell Westbrook was very out of line to say that. And not only, not only threaten him, but his <laughs> wife. I mean, you, you just don't do that. Um, but the Utah Jazz security gave him what I heard was a red card which is just kind of like a slap on the wrist, hey, don't do that again. Yes. Um, and then after the game, the fan was actually interviewed. So he got his 15 seconds, 15 minutes of fame that he wanted from doing that. So I think, I think all it's going to do is just encourage other fans um, to try to get that attention, try to get in the spotlight or the limelight, whatever you want to call it, yes. um, and get feedback from players. And, and the other thing is, you never know what kind of spot a player is emotional, you know? They're human too. Something horrible could have happened to Westbrook or his family before the game. He could have been kind of on edge and something like a guy could have just, you know, just kind of ticked him off and set him off. And, you know, if Russell slips up for five seconds, he's got a $25,000 fine. That is true. And speaking, we're going to switch gears. Speaking of uh, emotional players, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. was traded to the Cleveland, Cleveland Browns uh, Hunter, I'll start with you. Do you think this makes them Super Bowl contenders? Super Bowl contenders. Uh, I think they're certainly, <laughs> I think they're su certainly a playoff contender. I think they're a playoff team. That Baker Mayfield and um, Odell Beckham is um, a very strong connection. Um, not to mention their defense, um, and they've got a good young coach too. So I really like the Browns, and I think they will be a playoff contender. Okay. Well, I know for sure I hopped on the bandwagon. Uh, Bryce, <laughs> I, I know you said you're an Eagles fan, um, and you probably don't pay much attention to the Browns like most people who don't. But um, do you <laughs> think do you think this makes them Super Bowl contenders? I think that you know any team has a chance. You know, you have a good coach. I think they're a young team as well, and so I obviously. Like how you said, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. They're a very young team when they won the Super Bowl. Yes. So I do think that, you know, you have a lot of spirit and a lot of heart. And I do think that this Browns team does have that at least. And so they may not have the most talented team, which they do have some great players coming in, obviously. But, you know, I feel like they could win just from pure – or make, at least be a contender. Sorry, I, when I mm -hmm. said win, that was – but um, you never know, though. But I do think it could make them a contender as well. Like, if you just continue to, like, work hard and, like, the coach works with them in this offseason and everything, it's coming up. So I do think – that, you know, anyone has a chance. And so I think that it's definitely raised them up, though, a little bit, getting Odell Beckham Jr. I like it. I like it. And speaking of anybody having a chance, we're going to switch over a little bit to NCAA basketball. Yeah. Uh, give me y'all's opinion on who will be the first <coughs> pick in the NBA draft out of these three names. Zion Williamson, <laughs> R.J. Barrett, and Jay Moran. Hunter, I'll start with you. Well, it's, it's crazy that you even mentioned a player from the Ohio Valley Conference um, as a top pick in the draft. But John Morant has certainly proven himself this year. I think it would be incredible to see him. He's almost certainly going to be a lottery pick at this point. It would be incredible to see him as the one pick. But guys like Zion Williamson just don't come around very often. You know, he's 6'8", he's 280 pounds. 
uh, 40 inch vertical. I mean, he's an absolute freak. He's proven it this year, despite his injury, uh, which he's actually, um, Coach K said he's probably going to come back for the ACC tournament. Despite his injury, I think he's undoubtedly the number one pick in the draft. Thank you. And real quickly, Bryce, can you give me your pick? I agree. I do think it's going to be Zion. I, as much I agree with Hunter, as much as we love to see John Morant, an Ohio Valley Conference guy, I got to see him in person, you know, when he played Austin P and everything. And great to watch him play, but I mean, Zion is literally, the man jumped up and hit his head on the backboard. How many times do you see someone literally jump that high? Uh, but I do think I'm glad that he's getting better, and I hope to see him back in the conference tournament, But because you never want to see a player injured. But to me, I personally think it, it'll probably be Zion, but the other three are great players as well. Well, you heard it there. I will not be the first pick in NBA draft, so stick <laughs> with us on after the final whistle where we highlight some of the most outrageous tweets from athletes. We sit down in the Houston huddles with a word from Austin P. softball head coach Cassie Stanfield and have an MLB spring training update. Brianna Phillips here, back again with funny tweets from your favorite athletes. To start us off, we have retired NBA player Shaquille O'Neal tweeting, Dear Ashton Kutcher, yo mama's so old, the key on Ben Franklin's kite was to her apartment. Respond if you're not scared. Um, I'd like to point out Ashton did not respond, so he is scared like most other people when they see Shaquille O'Neal talking crap about their mom. I would have been terrified. I would have responded and told him he's right. My mom is that old. I'm sorry for what I did to you to make you do this. Uh, next up, we have Miami Dolphins wide receiver Kenny Stills, who tweeted, ran into a spider web playing Pokemon. Interesting to me because I didn't know anyone else besides myself still played Pokemon Go and actually ran into things while doing it. Um, never ran into a spider web. I would have been scared because I'm scared of spiders. So I've ran into a sidewalk before. Instead of stepping up, just hit it. It was embarrassing for me. So I can't imagine how he feels. Um, next, we have NBA and German national basketball team player Dirk Nowinski, who tweeted, the whole team calls me Ellen DeGeneres with my new hairdo at The Ellen Show. Interestingly enough, Ellen DeGeneres did not tweet him back, which is Confusing for me because Ellen usually likes to tweet back at people when they tweet her, especially celebrities. So I also think he needs a bit more highlighting and blonde to be able to be called Ellen because she's pretty blonde for her age. So uh, next we have defensive tackle for the NFL, Darnell Dockett, who tweeted, in other news, shout out to Kobe, one hell of a career. I never liked the Lakers, but he was as good as they come, besides snitching on Shaq. He was cool. Um, I agree, I'm a Kobe Bryant fan myself, so I really liked this shout out. Um, he might have been on the inside of that Shaq stuff. I wouldn't have snitched on Shaq, and I think most other people wouldn't. And I think Darnell's right here. He was cool besides snitching on him. Uh, next we have retired pitcher Dan Horan, who tweeted, two years ago I beat Corey Kluber, 1-0. Today I walked my two pugs while wearing a Pug Life t-shirt, life comes at you fast. This is interesting to me because he's now just a normal person. He used to be a pitcher in the MLB, he's not anymore, and he walks his dogs while wearing funny t-shirts. I walk my dog while wearing funny t-shirts, so we're all the same at the end of the day. Uh, former NFL wide receiver Chad Johnson, formerly Ocho Cinco, tweeted, I wonder what the orcas are doing in the ocean right now. You know, I wonder this too sometimes, Chad, but I, I'm not a celebrity, so if I tweeted this, it wouldn't be as weird as when you tweet it randomly. Um, I don't know if you were watching a documentary and that's what made you tweet this, or if you just were sitting at your home and wondering this. That's what I wanna know. I wanna know why you were wondering it. Next, we have American figure skater Adam Rippon, who tweeted, I've been bleaching my teeth for the past few days, and now the wind that I create from just talking makes them hurt. Like. I think this is a sign that I'm officially ready for my Olympic debut. Uh, I tried bleaching my teeth one time and it hurt a lot afterwards. I didn't take it as a sign to go to the Olympics, but I guess you do you. Um, I think it's gonna hurt a lot for you to do it afterwards. Please keep your mouth closed, have a mouth guard on. You know, protect your teeth because once they're gone, they're gone, bro. Uh, lastly, we are gonna dive into someone who's recently been in the media a lot. We have Tristan Thompson. But we're not gonna be talking about his cheating scandal here because that's not what we do. We talk about tweets from athletes. And here's a tweet from him. He said, is it okay to wear dress socks with Sperry's and some male booty, booty shorts? Big pause in parentheses, LOL. Tristan, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you no, it's not okay. 
please don't do it. Nobody wants to see it. Stay out of the media. Um, that's all the time I have for you today. Up next, we have Madeline Migliaccio with the Tom Brady cookbook. Thank you. Hello, I'm Madeline, and today I'm going to tell you how to eat like a goat. No, I am not referring to the cute farm animal that parkours everywhere they go. I am referring to the greatest of all time. I'm talking six-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady of the New England Patriots. The 41-year-old has just won yet another Super Bowl, and everyone keeps wondering how he does it. Well, I'm here to tell you this man has one of the strictest diets and exercise plans I have ever heard of. Tom Brady released his cookbook, The TB12 Method, How to Have a Lifetime of Peak Performance in early 2016, and the cookbook sold out within a matter of hours. In addition to wonderful pictures of Tom Brady contemplating life in the morning, eating everything covered in kale, he also includes 89 of his very own favorite recipes. These include a lot of coconut oil and vegetables I have never heard of. Forget cheese, bread, sugar, flour, anything that's in a package. Better yet, just eat raw vegetables with water. I'm talking recipes for things like avocado ice cream and walnut meat lasagna. Most people do not have to deal with the type of physical damage that comes with being a professional athlete, but Brady's holistic strict diet can be for people not just in the NFL. The TB12 method can help you train for that Netflix movie marathon or disc golf in the park. If you want to get more than a crash course telling you to not eat chicken nuggets, you should buy the TB12 method. But if your GPS does not know what a bookstore is, you can follow these four easy guidelines I have gathered. Number one, drinking water before and after meals is better than chugging water during your meal. Too much water with a meal interferes with digestion. Number two, if you cannot cut out tacos, I am speaking from personal experience, Brady says to fill the rest of your diet with about 80% of fruits and vegetables, and I doubt he means fruit roll-ups. Number three, luckily for us sitting on the couch watching Brady for his 20th season achieve 29 touchdowns and over 4,300 passing yards for the 2018 season, he says on weight training, lifting heavy and moving fast is counterintuitive and counterproductive. Number four, take your time and don't rush results. If you want the best results with minimal effort, Brady says to focus on his second favorite exercise behind cardio, and that is sleep. Turning off all electronic devices 30 minutes before bedtime. Brady's wife, Giselle, doesn't even allow TVs in their bedrooms. I imagine she doesn't want him seeing all those Peyton Manning commercials. So if you are what you eat, don't be a chicken, be a goat. Up next on After the Final Whistle, we have Brianna Phillips with a spring training update. Hi, Brianna here with the spring training update. Aside from all the Machado and Harper hype that we'll get into in a second, there has been talk that Clayton Kershaw might not be ready for opening day. This is coming off reports that he hasn't thrown a single bullpen session since February 20th due to some so shoulder so soreness. Next, we have baseball's top prospect beginning in Toronto, AAA. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is a third baseman who played 30 games in 2018, hitting 336 with six homers in the year. All eyes are on him this year, but he suffered a grade A left oblique strain earlier this week, and he will likely need three weeks to recover. The injury to Guerrero officially takes him out of the running for the open, to open the season in Toronto, though he wouldn't have much, stood much of a chance to crack this roster even if he remained healthy. Troy Tulowinski has started off good with the Yankees this preseason. He's only played in three games, but he homered in his first at-bat for the Yankees. He comes off of a long-running career on the DL for the most part, but with Didi Gregorius healing from Tommy John surgery, they will have to rely on Tulo for now. We have an update on Tim Tebow from Port St. Lucie. After spending his last season in AA Binghampton, where he hit 273 with six home runs and 36 RBIs, the Heisman Trophy winner and former, former Broncos quarterback recorded his first hits of the spring Monday with a pair of singles against the Red Sox in Grapefruit League action. He is now two for nine through four games played, and as a non-roster invitee to camp, the outfitter is projected to begin 2019 with AAA Syracuse. It took the whole offseason for the top free agents in baseball to sign, with Manny Machado signing uh, 10 years for $300 million with the Padres and Bryce Harper signing for 13 years at $330 million with the Phillies. Foreseeably, they set the floor for the game's best player, Angels outfitter Mike Trout, hits the market after the 2020 season. The 27-year-old with a 64.3 career WAR and 240 home runs will likely demand an astronomical contract, even at 29, for the deal in the vicinity of 10-plus years and at half a billion dollars. It is not out of the question for him. 
who's the early leading front runner for Mike Trout? As Bryce Harper explained at his introductory presser in Philadelphia, there's another guy in about two years that comes off the books. We'll see what happens with that. That's all the time I have for you guys today. Up next is Houston's Huddle. Welcome into Houston's Huddle. I'm Bree Houston, and today we're joined by head coach of the softball team, Cassie Stanfield. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. So you are the 10th coach in Austin Peay's history. How does it feel? You know, it's an honor. Um, extremely excited to be here. I'm excited to work with my student athletes. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's just a good time to be a governor. Now, before you started coaching, you were also a player. What's your favorite memory about being out there on the diamond? I was very fortunate, uh, high school-wise as well as college, uh, to compete at the highest level, um, win some championships, go to regionals. You know, the NCAA tournament I think is something. If you can be a part of it, you know, that's it. Just takes you to the next level. Now, you've been a head coach for five years. Uh, excuse me, five months now. <laughs> How was it to adjust from assistant coach to being a head coach? The transition has been a journey. Uh, you know, I think those first few months, you don't really know what to expect, but I've been fortunate enough to have a support staff that's surrounded um, me, you know, as my assistants, as well as our administration. Um, they've kind of helped me get a little bit more comfortable, get my feet under me. And now, you know, it's, it's go time for the spring. Speaking of journey, what was your journey that led you to Austin P? I was first an assistant at Middle Tennessee. I was there for a couple of years, and then I made my way to Ball State, which is in the MAC. Um, had the chance to be an associate head at University of Illinois, and then had the chance to play at University of Louisville, which um, that's where I played, so I had to go and, and actually coach there. Why Austin P? Again, I think when I came on campus, I um, just had this gut feeling, one, it's a family environment, which is something that I truly thrive in. Um, and then it's just a good time to be a part of the Austin P family. I think for the future, um, you know, I continue to see success with it growing um, and improving daily. Now with your history of playing as well as coaching, what is it that you're gonna bring to Austin P? I hope to bring just um, some consistency, um, stability, uh, as well as excitement uh, for our student athletes and our fans. Now, this year's team only has one freshman, yes. a lot of sophomores and juniors and seniors. Who's going to lead you guys? We're very fortunate that our senior class, um, they're, I would say, our rock. Um, so we're, we're going to lean on them for, you know, the next 56 games to, to take, the, take the lead of the team. Now, one last question before you go. You've been involved in softball for a number of years, playing and coaching, as I mentioned. If not softball, what would you be doing? I would probably be a strength and conditioning coach, just you know, being able to stay in athletics and, and being around a competitive environment. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, I'm Madeline, and you're watching the live Govs on the Go interview. Today we have a very special guest. We have Mr. Sam from the Clarksville Climbing Gym. He's actually the owner of the gym. Um, I'm super excited to have him here. The Clarksville Climbing Gym has been such a great addition to the community since last summer of 2018. And I have to say, I feel like rock climbing is one of the fastest growing most fun recreation sports that I think is going on. Like we have the rock wall at the Foy that we were talking about, and I'm super intrigued to learn about what you've got going on at the gym. So can you just tell me a little bit about what type of climbing it is and a little bit about the gym? Sure, so at Clarksville Climbing, we focus purely on the movement of climbing through an art called bouldering. So with bouldering, you don't have to worry about any of the gear that's involved. So you don't have to worry about the rope failing or how to belay. It's just you moving on the wall. So it's really good for somebody that has never climbed before to come in and experience it. That's amazing. So if we, someone was to come in, they don't even have to really bring any equipment. You supply everything that you need, like shoe rentals and yep. things like that. Yep, and which is pretty much all you need. You yeah. need shoes and chalk. Shoes and chalk. That's too easy. It's almost so. too easy. Um, I feel like I follow you on social media. Instagram mainly is what I use. So I see all of like your new posts, all of your theme nights. Can you just tell me a little bit about like some of the fun that you guys have there? What kind of stuff you have going on? Yeah, so the, the first thing is we have classes. So if you are worried about coming in and actually being able to climb, we have classes that we do once a month. This class is going to be this Saturday or for March. It's going to be this Saturday. Um, 
it's free for members and then it's half price for non-members. So it's a really good experience to come in and do that. We also have uh, half or not, we have a, a discounted rate on Wednesdays for college students. And then the fourth Friday of every month is date night. Date night. Wow, that sounds like so, a, a dream date almost. You go boulder climbing. That sounds very adventurous and fun. Yeah, works <laughs> out amazing. well. Um, I've seen, so some of like, if you, what you were going to say, if you were going to tell some Austin P people if they're like super newbies and they want to come out, but they're a little like nervous about climbing. I know you have like some really good employees that are always there to answer questions and everything like that too. So what would you say to any newbies? don't be afraid of change. So whenever you're trying something new, there's always that certain fear that keeps you back. And this doesn't just apply to Clarksville climbing, but it applies to everything that you do in life, which is one of the things that I love about climbing, is it helps build that confidence that you need. So just don't be afraid of that, of that new thing. Uh, in the climbing community, you'll see like a brand new climber when they get something, everybody is excited for it. It doesn't matter if it's a brand new climber that's doing it or an experienced climber, everybody's cheering for that's everyone amazing. else. That's amazing, like the teamwork, even though it's like you're kind of doing it by yourself, there's still like a team aspect of it. That's really right. interesting. Right, that, and that's actually something else that is good about bouldering is it's low enough to the ground where you're, even when you're on the wall, you're still connected to the people that are around you and you're watching each other, or how you're doing the moves and problem solving. So you can really help each other out. So I'd love to talk about a little bit, I mentioned like your social media, you have a very good presence on social media and everything. So Thanks. I see all of like the rocks that you have specific names for and like come in and conquer it and you get to sign the rock. Like where do you come up with these names? So the, the names just, the person that sets the problem gets to name the problem. Um, and that just comes from a, a long tradition of climbing where it's just the first ascensionist is the person that gives that problem the name. And then you mentioned getting to sign off. That's our boulder problem of the day. So if we, we, spec, uh, sorry, we pick out specific problems uh, each day, and if you climb that, then you get to sign that. Really? So that's it's, super cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And sometimes it's super easy and sometimes it's really hard. Yeah. So there's there's different levels. And um, I know that I'm interested. You said you called them a problem. Is that like what you call like the tracks that you have to go through? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's all color coded, I believe. So do you have like more beginner levels, more intermediate and like almost expert levels as well? We do. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I wanted to talk, we talked a little bit about the FOI. I mentioned how we had the rock wall. I know you said you were doing some type of thing with them. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so the FOI Center has a nice climbing wall there, and they're having a competition coming up in two Saturdays where uh, they're going to bring people in, and it's a competition where you're on the ropes, and we'll be sponsoring that. So. That's or be exciting. one of the sponsors. For Are you going to have people like from the gym there that's watching the event and doing all that stuff? If I'm in town, I'll be there. Yeah, that's that's very exciting. Getting AP involved, we love it. Yeah. We do. Um, now I'm curious about where like where the inspiration to build the gym came from. Like it's only been open for I guess you'll be coming up on your year this summer. Where did we will. how did you get started? How'd you come up with this idea? Wow, uh, that actually is going to take a long time to answer that. So I'll just try to you know, narrow it down a little bit. I just have a huge passion for climbing and the things that it's given me in my life, I wanted to give that to Clarksville, to the community here. So uh, confidence building, I already mentioned, is one of those big things. Um, we had a, a youth in the gym that was, he, when he first started, he was really shy and uh, just the other day he, he walked up to a complete stranger and asked him if they needed help there at the gym. And it was just a really inspiring moment where I saw like this confidence is going over into the community. It's fantastic. That so. is amazing. I'm super excited that you're here in Clarksville. I was born here. So like just seeing all these like new businesses and then like a climbing gym. I've never done boulder climbing. I think I've, I've been two times to the gym, um, but I had a great time both times I was there. So can you just tell me how we get in contact with you, the hours that you're open? So you can go to ClarksvilleClimbing.com or our Facebook page or Instagram page. They both have some really good information there. 
Awesome. Well, then that's like basically all we need. I want to say thank you again to Sam from the Clarksville Climbing Gym. Um, make sure you go check out the gym. Go see the FOI sponsored competition that we're going to be having come up. And then next on after the final whistle, we've got the two minute sports drill coming up next. I'm Anna Claire and this is the AP two minute sports drill. With baseball and softball in full swing, as well as the women's golf team traveling to Florida, Austin Peay has had a very lively week. First, let's get started with Austin Peay baseball. Sunday afternoon, starting pitcher Jacques Bichu pitched eight shutout innings at the start of the Ohio Valley Conference play, ending in a 2-0 victory against Murray State. The following Monday night, starting pitcher Brandon Vial provided a great start, but APSU struggled offensively, which led to an 0-4 loss against Murray State. The Governors will face Tennessee Tech Friday, March 15th at home. The Austin Peay softball team took advantage of their home opening doubleheader against North Alabama, winning the first game 9-1. The Governors struggled the second game, taking a loss of 0-4. The AP softball team will travel to Ohio to face the Dayton Flyers March 15th. Austin Peay's women's golf is fourth in the OVC, voted by the league head coaches. The women's tennis team remains undefeated with 10 wins under their belt after a three-match road stretch, spanning all the way from Florida to Georgia. Claudia Yanes garcia remains undefeated in singles this spring with a 9-0 record. Overall, Garcia is 13-2 in singles since the fall and remains one of the top two spots in the lineup. The doubles duo Tatiana Lopez and Hanoko Nanishi is also on a six-match win streak after winning against Valdosta State. The women's tennis team will face Tennessee State in the OVC matchup at home on March 23rd. Thank you, and this has been the AP Two Minute Sports Drill. This has been After the Final Whistle. We'll be back next week to talk current topics in the world of sports. From everyone here at After the Final Whistle, including Hunter's LeBron James Sox, thanks for watching. Until next time, we're out. <laughs>